My name is Joel Reidenberg. Uh, I'm delighted to be back here at CITP uh, to give a lunch talk. Uh, ordinarily, I, I teach at Fordham. Uh, and I had the, the pleasure of spending a year here uh, as a visiting professor and uh, been able to continue as an affiliate with, with CITP. Um, my talk this morning, or this afternoon rather, uh, is on a project uh, that uh, I'm doing with the team uh, looking at <clears throat> privacy policy language and ambiguity in privacy policy language and what can we learn from measuring ambiguity uh, with respect to regulation and how we regulate privacy policies. Uh, this particular paper is part of a much broader project uh, that I'm involved with uh, principal investigators at Carnegie Mellon, at Stanford. We have a large team working on something called the Usable Privacy Project where we're trying to develop technologies and tools to make notice and choice more effective for users. Uh, it's a three and a half year uh, program funded by the NSF. Uh, our ultimate <clears throat> endpoint is to try to have some plugins for browsers that will be able, in an automated or semi automated way, figure out what a privacy policy is actually saying and display it in a way for a user that they're going to understand it at a moment in time when it's meaningful for them. So it's a combination, the bigger project is a combination of natural language processing, machine learning, and crowdsourcing to come uh, to, to this stage. And we're about uh, at this point, we're, we're a little more than two years into the project. Um, this paper came out of some of the early work that we did um, looking at crowdsourcing and how crowdsourcing worked uh, for <clears throat> policy interpretation. And we published a paper that found different user groups couldn't agree on the meaning of statements in privacy policies. And we thought, we began thinking about why aren't they agreeing? What's the problem? Is it the way it's drafted, is it ambiguous? Is it the type of practices aren't clear? Uh, and we decided it would be very interesting to take a look at this problem of ambiguity. Because if the language is too ambiguous, then crowd workers won't be able to come to an agreement on the interpretation. You won't be able to build NLP tools that will successfully tell users what it means if there is no clear meaning coming out of the language actually drafted in the policy. So we set out in this paper um, to really do two things. One was to develop some kind of theory to measure uh, and compare vague and ambiguous language in privacy policies. It turns out on the linguistics and computer science side, um, there isn't a great consensus on how to go about doing this. And what is it you study? How do you study it? So our first step is we wanted to be able to figure out how could we compare one policy to another to determine which is the vaguer of the two policies. We weren't looking, we weren't thinking about an absolute standard. We weren't thinking about, is this, does this meet a minimum threshold of clarity? <clears throat> because that's a much more challenging and goes a lot further than what we thought we needed to do. We wanted to simply be able to say, here are a couple of policies, as between a group of policies, can we say this one is worse in terms of its language in describing with clarity the data practices compared to another. So we first had to construct, and I'll spend a lot of time talking about <clears throat> the construct of the model that we came up with. And then what we realized is if we can compare policies, we can use that to ask a more fundamental normative question, which is what's the role of regulation in the clarity of statements in privacy policies? If we have benchmarks, if we can look at a set of privacy policies drafted under a benchmark legal standard, we can compare that to policies that aren't using that legal standard. And as it turns out, there were two really good benchmarks we could use. Um, the seven financial service regulatory agencies jointly agreed on a model privacy disclosure form, the con language in a model form. Uh, so that's one, and I'll talk about this, it's one type of regulatory approach. <clears throat> the other benchmark that's out there is the US-Europe Safe Harbor Agreement, which even though it got struck down a week ago by the European court, for our purposes, thankfully, uh, that didn't matter. Because the, the Safe Harbor Agreement had a different model of regulation of privacy disclosure as compared to what the financial services regulators did. So we can look at the Safe Harbor model, we can look at companies that had complied with the Safe Harbor model, 
and compare how do those policies score to the financial benchmark policies as compared to the world of unregulated policies and begin to draw some inferences and conclusions about what the regulation is doing with respect to the clarity in language. <clears throat> um, clarity in language is really critical, not just for the uh, mechanics of our uh, usable privacy tools project, but also for the meaning and value of a privacy notice. If in our legal system we rely on notice and choice for privacy, that's been the whole mantra for U.S. privacy protection for the last 20 years. If the notices are so ambiguous that they don't convey what data practices are, then that whole notice and choice regime falls apart. You can't, there's, there's no clear commitment being made. There's nothing that's enforceable because it's using too many weasel words. So you really don't have a clear statement. And users really aren't being told in a meaningful way what's going on. You read a policy, you don't understand what it means. So <clears throat> when we look at these, um, there are lots of different forms of vagueness. Yeah, question? Uh, by clarity, do you mean um, clarity to the layperson or clarity to uh, you know, a lawyer who then could interpret it in, in lay terms? We're looking at this as clear to a layperson because these are consumer-facing policies as opposed to for lawyers. Um, so when you think about vagueness and ambiguity, there are lots of different dimensions on it. So I, I had some fun finding signs. I think my two favorites were this little one here, slow children at play. Right. Now, what does that mean? Is, are they slow children, right? Dis, like learning challenge children? Or is it drivers slow down because children are at play? Right. The way this, you have to make some assumptions to figure that out. Um, the one that I really liked, though, was from this United Methodist Church, the Church of the Cross. The sign, the street sign was, don't let worries kill you, let the church help. <laughs> now, is the church helping to kill you, or is the church helping to make your worries go away? Um, you get the drift, right? There are lots of different permutations um, to vagueness. So <clears throat> we started by thinking about how do we come up with the taxonomy of vague and ambiguous terms? And there's a distinction between vague and ambiguous. Um, in, in law, it's interesting, in law, we talk about an ambiguous contract because the terms used in the contract could be susceptible to multiple meanings. That's one way of looking at it. Vague terms, which we think is really a subset of ambiguity, um, it, it arises in an instance where there is uncertainty. So the contract says, I'll buy all your widgets. Well, how many widgets? We don't know. It's vague. All. The use of the word all, it's vague. It's a numeric, what we call it a numeric quantifier. It's a vague term. We don't know what that means. If the parties understand well enough so that as between them it's not vague, the contract will stand. If the parties don't understand, the contract fails for indefiniteness. Ambiguity raises some other issues in contracting. I won't really get into it. But what we started to do is pull out language and privacy policies to see what are some of the terms that they're using that could fall on one of these axes. So you see an instance, this is from Barnes & Noble. Depending on how you choose to interact with Barnes & Noble Enterprise, we may collect personal information from you. So we have a term here, we may. So we don't know if, in fact, they are. We have a contingency depending. Right, so we don't know if this contingency comes to pass. So just reading the sentence, we're not sure. Right, what's it describing? Um, you see a clear one, a declaratory one, number four. Similarly, when you enroll in our member loyalty program, we will ask you to submit personal information. We will. So here, we know it's going to happen. We don't know, though, what personal information is. But they haven't told us that. So we, we can surmise, but we're going to have to make some assumptions. We see others. In addition, we disclose certain personal information. Right? What's certain? Um, we collect your information as necessary. Right? It's a condition. Something has to be necessary. Uh, so what we, we find from these different examples is there are lots of different variations that vagueness uh, comes up, different contexts in which it comes up. It turns out that when you start looking at the linguistic studies, there is no uh, consensus on the kinds of categories that compose vagueness. So there are different ways of looking at it. Um, there are different types of approaches, whether it's semantic, 
linguistic, modal, there, there are a whole series of them. We ended up distilling, we looked at a variety of other studies, we distilled into four categories that we were going to care about. Um, and these are drawn from things that we think are going to have a, a significance for comparative purposes. Most of the other studies that we saw dealt with measuring vagueness to try to understand the substance of a policy. Right? We don't care if the policy describes really bad privacy practices. What we care about is it clearly describing those really bad privacy practices. So we had four categories. We looked at conditions, um, which are actions that are dependent on some variable or a trigger factor that we don't know is going to happen. We look at generalizations. Um, the action, what we call action and information type. Action is the data practice. Information type is it's applying to some information. So it would be, I collect your personal information. Collect is the action. That's the practice. I'm collecting your data. Um, it's, it's vaguely abstracted. So if it says, I will generally collect your information, we use that term generally. That's the classic generalization. Modality. Uh, there's a vague likelihood or an ambiguous possibility that this will take place. So when I use the word I may collect, the word may, it's, it's vague. It's un, we don't know is it happening or is it not happening. Right? So it's a possibility, hence it's a modal, that's a modal verb. Then we have numeric quantifiers. Um, I collect some personal information. Well, how much? Right? There is a term that's being used that's, that's quant, it's a quantifier, but it's it's not precise. It's, it's going to be very vague. So to see how this works, um, we take an example. This is close to a real example. We, we added a couple things here just to be, to be able to illustrate it better. Of a privacy sentence, uh, of a phrase in a privacy policy that shows how these different um, vague terms are going to be appearing. So we generally may share personal information we collect on the site with certain service providers some of whom may use the information for their own purposes as necessary. And what we've done is we've identified how we would annotate these. So we have a generalization, generally, a modal verb, may. We have two vague quantifiers, certain service providers, some of whom, and another modal verb, and then we have a condition, as necessary. So we're beginning to see <clears throat> how this will play out. Here's a sentence. Do I have any clue what this means? for data practices. Do I really know with any degree of certainty what they're collecting, who they're sharing with it, who they're sharing with, and how much they're sharing? Right. There's a lot of hedging taking place here. Um, we looked at a, a set of 15 policies um, to do our analysis. Although it was a small sample set. We did this to be able to develop the automated tools that we now have so we can actually deploy this on larger numbers of privacy policies going forward. Um, we used a technique called grounded analysis where you, re you look at these policies and you try to pull out, our goal was to pull out terms to fit within those four categories that were typical terms used in these policies that we can then train the, the NLP algorithm on to search them out and, and work with us on developing our algorithm. So we chose these policies. We chose five from three different areas, um, shopping, telecoms, employment. Uh, the choices were driven by we wanted a diversity of kind of shopping sites, telecom sites. Um, we wanted large players so that these were prominent policies uh, that would be covering lar large sectors. Um, the employment, these sites are the more prominent um, job search sites were, were the group of employment sites that, that we looked at. And in doing the analysis, um, we came up with a taxonomy of the typical vague terms that you find in these policies. Uh, we don't know if this is domain specific to privacy policies. Um, that's something that I think going forward would be a real interesting question for applicability of this model and techniques to some other areas that, that I'll talk about at the end. Um, but we came up with a taxonomy here of different terms that fall within these um, different uh, categories. Um, in looking at the, um, the, the policies, the interesting landscape from those policies, almost 74% were modal terms. That was the most frequent. And then there's a huge drop off. So what we're seeing is a predominance of modal, ver modal verbs, usually, in privacy policies. Um, 
But this poses a challenge for us. When we think about how do we score, right? we want to score it so that we can compare one against another and compare one against a group or groups against other groups. Um, we had to think, well, what's the impact? Right? If this is going to be the most frequent, um, if this is disproportionately vague compared to other terms, clearly that's going to dwarf everything. So we started thinking a lot about how you compare um, vagueness. And we got into some questions. So two examples. We may generally collect versus we may collect as needed. Which one is vaguer? Is there, is there a difference in perception? Right? On a theory level, we can see, well, we may collect generally. It's a general case. It assumes it's likely to happen often. Versus as needed, it's an exceptional case not likely to occur as frequently. Um, there may be something that this case gives the website less flexibility in how it uses data, because it's stating it only when it's needed can they use it or can they collect it, versus here they're almost always going to do it. So in a sense, there's a little bit of a conflation between the flexibility reserved to the website and the, percep and the potential perception of vagueness of these um, sentences. So when we looked at them, you begin to think, OK, there are going to be differences between here, um, we're changing uh, a generalization. This is a generalization term. This is a condition term. So we're kind of probing, is there a difference between using a modal verb, a generalization, a condition term? What happens if you start combining them? What's the impact? And we started, we came up with kind of a lattice that, as we began to think about this. That you start with something simple. Here we added, a t we may add a generalization, a condition, a numeric quantifier. We add, we have two terms in this phrase. We now have three. So the sort of working hypothesis is, as we move down this lattice, vagueness will increase because you're adding more vague terms. Now, we may hit a saturation point where it just becomes so impossible to decipher that you can throw in more terms, take away a couple terms, and it won't impact on, um, uh, on the overall perception that a user has. Uh, so how do we then figure that, you know, what do you do? How do you figure this out? I saw when I gave the, this earlier example, um, there was some squint. Uh, I'm going to infer from the squinting that you really didn't see a difference in vagueness between these two. Right. Um, we did some interesting sort of, you know, lunchroom polling and asked people. And it was really interesting to see these differences that would crop up. So you need to do a scientific study. Um, my colleagues, Jess Pre uh, Bhatia and Travis Bro, uh, did a paired comparison analysis uh, where we used pairings of all the combinations of the words in our taxonomy to begin to figure out how relative to each other they affected user's perception of vagueness um, in the sentence. So it was, you know, which of these two is clear? It was essentially each, each of these pairs. They were given a whole series of pairs. Which are the clearer ones? From the study, uh, they were able to calculate uh, Bradley-Terry coefficients. So this is getting into the statistics stuff that I rely on them for. Um, this is a uh, statistical uh, convention that enables you to compare, using the pair comparison, how much of an effect different combinations have on users' understanding. So what we have on this graph, um, this shows the pair, the pair comparisons of different combinations of the categories. So on the far end, this shows a um, condition and a numeric uh, quantifier, CNN, condition numeric quantifier. Um, this is a condition and a modal term. Uh, CM. And what you find is these conditions and, and numeric quantifiers are pretty much um, equivalent. Where you begin to see some real differences, when you look down here, the scoring down here is about 1.5, 1.6. Up here it's well over 4. Uh, which is telling us as you double it, so 1.5 to these. These groups are about twice as vague as these groups. That's the perception users have. Yeah. 
people have to make a choice between <coughs> the two, or could they say these are equally vague, or I would respond to both of them in the same way? Yes, they they, they could they could they could say there was no difference. They're equally vague. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, that. <laughs> um, so what we're seeing on the left side. Again, these, these, are the le these are the clearest. Com these combinations are perceived as clear, clearer descriptions than the combinations up here. The worst up here is a generalization with the modal term. So it would be, I may generally collect your information. Right? That, that is the vaguest as far as um, the, the users were concerned. Um, what the red arrow here shows, which is really sort of interesting, is when you begin to combine some of the terms, so this is a numeric quantifier with a modal term. So I may collect some information. If I add a condition to it, I improve clarity. So I may collect some information as needed. I move from here to here. On the other hand, if I add a generalization term, I bounce up here. It goes uh, much more. Now, um, this metric only gets us to a certain degree. We're missing, we're not accounting for one attribute of vagueness in privacy policies, which is silence. Right? What happens if the policy doesn't address the data practice? From a user's perspective, it's not necessarily clear what will happen. So for example, the policy says nothing about sharing. What does it mean? Do they share or do they not share? Um, we created a different metric for that, uh, which was simply a presence or absence of a term associated with one of four characteristics. Uh, the four characteristics, which we'll show on one of the charts, came from a study we did on the privacy harms most frequently litigated in the real world. So who, what are people suing over? We found they bucketed into four categories. So those were the four categories we looked at. It's just a very rudimentary cut. You could come up with as complete a laundry list of clauses that you'd want to be able to develop a metric for completeness um, as a value. We haven't really gotten carefully into that yet. Yeah? It does seem to be looking just at vagueness and not at ambiguity, right? Because, yes. Uh, because if you have two people who are very convinced that it means opposite things, that would still come up as not vague here. It could. Right? Because they both, if they each think it's clear, but they think if it's If they each clear, think they it's crystal clear, different. but they're coming up with different answers. Right. right. That would not necessarily, yeah. That's right. Um, so this now gives us the basis to really build our relative scoring model. Yeah, say that. I, kind of, I guess like my question, what do you <laughs> what do I, I mean in the sense that, because you're not asking whether they, like there's no checking in, in this kind of survey that you're doing whether the representation in the privacy policy is in any way reflecting their practices versus the user has understood something which may in any way reflect right. what they meant in the policy versus what they actually do. Right. We don't know. This is only looking at stated declarations in the policy. We don't know what the actual practices are. All we're looking at is how are they describing their activities. I guess my question is when you look at those two statements, as Joel. Right. Right. And, and it, one has generalization and one has conditions. Yeah. And that you know, would obviously make things jump. Mm -hmm. Yes. What do you think? Like, just saying you see two statements and you're like, you know, as a lawyer, I would not interpret these two statements differently. And I'm really just asking that. Well, no. I, I, they're, they're di as a lawyer, there would be different metrics. So if I have something that says I may generally collect, as a lawyer, I read that as saying, okay, you know, you've got lots of flexibility here. If I read it as I may collect as needed, um, then I know I can argue the parameters, whether or not it was needed. And, and I c if, if the organization collects the data, and they say it was needed. I say, no, it's not. We can dispute that. If it uses the term generally, I've got nothing to argue over. Uh, but it's still, but again, I think it's important also to stress, this is still not addressing what they actually do. All this is addressing is what they say. And the reason, I'll come back, the reason we think this is really important is if we want to try to develop technologies to assist users interact with websites so that users really understand what, what's going on. And we don't want to rely on cooperation of the websites, which is one of the reasons why, for example, P3P failed. P3P needed cooperation of the websites. It wasn't there. Didn't ha just didn't really work. 
Here we can take their natural language statements and use technical tools to translate them for users. But that's not going to work if those natural language statements are written in a way that is essentially meaningless. Uh, the other thing that it also says is if they're writing them in ways that are meaningless, then that's a spot for the regulators to become active. And if we can identify industry sectors that are particularly egregious or individual actors that are particularly egregious, you now are raising red flags for regulators, for class action lawyers, for lots of different enforcement possibilities if the sites are doing it intentionally. If they're not doing it intentionally, you're giving them an early warning to be able to fix it. Um, yeah. Really asking the lawyers, it seems that indeed, given your response, the reason you put wiggle room in is specifically as a corporation is to minimize the ability for people to litigate yeah, against you. Um, so, in some sense, the given that, I mean, the, I'm curious what you think by egregiousness, because if there's not regulatory to require certain things, that um, you know, this is a valid um, construction of what they do. They just don't want to be cornered perhaps by class action lawsuits right. who themselves the lawyers so this make is a lot the of money doing into a little corner. Ch the lawyers are trying to preserve the maximum flexibility sure. for their client. Right. So unchecked, and I think this is where our, fi the, our preliminary finding gets, unchecked, it results in privacy policies that are meaningless. <coughs> so if we want the privacy policies to have some value and meaning, there needs to be a better median found between preserving flexibility and, and effectively conveying data practices to users. And we think, in fact, this tool, these tools that we're building will be able to help advance that ball. Um, I, I, I guess the follow-on related question was, so one of the things that happened in a lot of web things has been notification that you, yeah. whenever a website changes their policy policy, you have to right. really give it in front of the users. And so one of the reasons why you also put vagueness in your term is so that you basically future-proof your policy mm -hmm. against changes. So you know, if you bring out a new third-party service provider, right. for corporate, for business reasons, you may or may not want to even keep confidential. You don't have to rewrite your policy mm -hmm. because you enumerate every of the 50 third parties you use. Yeah. Sure. So I guess the question is, what do you think the solution is? I mean, giving somebody a notification every week is not a good solution from a usability perspective. No. Well, I think what the solution is going to be is down the road, we're going to have to have much more customized notices in that it'll be a little more just in time based on what kind of activity you're doing when you're doing it. And if these kinds of tools are in fact developed, it means you don't have to push out a notice every time it changes, you just have to keep it updated on some spot on your site and the automated tools will find it and inform a user at a relevant point in time so you're not bombarding a user with meaningless information. I think that's something that we may, uh, I think we're going to ultimately have to move toward if we want to preserve some sense of consumer awareness and protection for the consumer. Uh, Paul, you had your hand up a moment ago? Yeah, how it works in, in practice. Say that Amazon has promised me, I don't know if they did or not, that they would never share my order history with anybody else. Right. And then they decide that they will. Yes. Is, is there any constraint on them to retrospectively honor my order history up until the point that they? make that change, or are it, they free to? It'll depend on what they stated in their privacy policy when they collected the information. If they, as most of them do now, say, you know, we may revise it from time to time, and if we do so, then you're in for, unless you tell us otherwise, you're going to be subject to the new policy, which comes back to Mike's point about having these uh, constant notifications. His question was slightly different, though, I think, which was not that can they change it, but if they change it, does, does the it old data get grandfathered or yeah. not? Yeah. Well, the, again, the answer is depends on what they stated in the policy. Most policies today would not grandfather old data to the old policy. It would import the old data into the terms of the new policy. Uh, Which means that basically, so, if you sign up agreeing to a privacy policy that you like that stipulates that it could be changed, yeah. You're out of luck. Well, it's basically, well, if you give anybody any information, you can't really get it back. One of the yeah. things that this that we hope this will begin to do is expose the, this this problem where lawyers and businesses have been seeking to maximize the flexibility because of some of these legit these are legitimate business issues, 
but they've done it in a way that pushed the pendulum so far away from the protection of the consumers uh, that it's no longer, these policies are no longer meaningful. And here by exposing, by showing these ambiguity issues, can we help affect the change in the ecosystem is something that we'd like to see happen. Um, we came up with a scoring model. Uh, now this was actually my attempt uh, to write it as math, so my apologies to my uh, statistical co-authors. Um, our score, we used the Bradley-Terry coefficients. That was kind of our starting point. So we know that if we have these kinds of combinations of our four categories, conditional, modal, generalization, numeric, we know what effect the combination will have. So what we did was we took the Bradley-Terry coefficients for every sentence in the policy that had a data practice associated with information. So if, if there was a, an action item, a data practice, but it didn't relate to personal information, right, we didn't want to put a score on it. That wasn't vagueness for our purpose. We only care about the, pri the way they describe privacy activity. So we took the bradley terry coefficient for each sentence that had a data practice associated with uh, personal information. We simply sum them up for the policy. And that's great, but what happens if it's a really long policy and all of those uh, vague terms are concentrated in one paragraph. The policy may look great, even though in fact it's problematic. We decided at that point that we would then, nor in effect, normalize it by taking the sum of all of the action information sentences in the policy. So we have a number. This is going to generate a number that tells us something about the proportion of vague terms used in sentences as to all sentences associated with these action information pairings. So if it uses a lot of really clear language in these, it's going to do well. If it uses a lot of really vague language in just about every sentence, it's going to do poorly on this score. Um, we decided to take a look at not just the overall policy, but these four data practice characteristics that people sue about. So the four characteristics were um, <coughs> yeah, collection, sharing, use, retention. Different permutations of those four basic characteristics. And we chose, as I mentioned before, the model privacy form and the safe harbor. These were going to be our two regulatory models. So the model privacy form um, comes about under the graham leach bliley statute. This is the statute that requires financial service institutions to tell you once a year what their pri privacy policies are. You get those little notices in your bank statement, you promptly ignore them, they're all Greek, they have to do it. Um, under Graham Leach Bliley, there's seven different regulatory agencies that get a piece of financial services regulation uh, because of the way we carve it up in the United States. Under Graham Leach Bliley, the seven agencies got together and they agreed on model disclosure language and it's called the model privacy form. The regulatory approach is if a financial services organization uses this model, they are deemed to be in compliance with their Graham Leach Bliley obligation. If they don't, then they have to come up with their own customized, personalized privacy statement. Uh, so what it tells us is it, it's, it's a safety valve. It's a, safe, it's a safe harbor in a sense. If you use it, you know you're complying with GLBA. Uh, the government didn't mandate the language, but the government gave language. And they gave language after going through a public notice process, Administrative Procedure Act process, where they published the draft, they took comments, they republished the draft, they did user testing on it, they did a lot of research into the language used in this policy. So that's one, I'll call it sort of the regulated language. The regulators give language. The second is Safe Harbor. So Safe Harbor was this agreement between the United States and Europe that stipulates for American companies to be able to get data from Europe, they have to publish a privacy notice that describes what they do, and it has to contain certain kinds of features. So it has to provide user choice. It has to do X, Y, and Z. It doesn't stipulate specific language, but it does stipulate certain pretty specific features that the language has to address. So it's not quite unregulated, but it's not nearly as regulated as this model is. Companies sign up voluntarily to Safe Harbor. So even though it's struck down, it was struck down under European law, for our purposes, fortunately, that was irrelevant. What we care about is the regulatory model. Here are things, 
here is a, a, a set of requirements that have to be in your policy. And you can implement it in various ways. We're not telling you how to implement it, but it's kind of directional um, as to how uh, it will look. So we took these, and then we took, uh, so for the financial services, we took four big banks that used the um, model financial services form. Uh, I think J.P. Morgan was one, Citi was another. I mean, they were big household banks. Um, we used them. We looked, as it turned out, most of the employment companies that we used to do our grounded analysis had signed up for Safe Harbor, and Barnes & Noble had. So of the 15 companies that we were starting with, five of them actually already belonged to Safe Harbor. So we calculated the scores using that algorithm, and we calculated them for the overall vagueness and then for each of these four attributes, collection, retention, sharing, and use. Um, lo and behold, the financial services score is the lowest. It scores point, the mean was 0.46. The unregulated were 1.48. The difference statistically <coughs> means these policies are three times vaguer than these. Because the, with the, the way the Bradley Terry coefficient shows the, the drag. Um, the safe harbor policies were 1.33, only slightly better than the unregulated, um, far off from what the financial services were. Um, the telecommunications ones were the worst at 1.57. Uh, it's not surprising. We put the employment ones here because we were looking at, originally we were looking at, at the, these three middle groups. Um, the employments were, of the three groups were the lowest, 1.26. It's not that surprising because four out of the five belong to Safe Harbor. So to the extent that Safe Harbor was a little bit better than unregulated, uh, we would have expected to see the employment slightly better. But it was really striking to see the radical difference between the regulated model where language was stipulated by the regulators and these two other, the, the Safe Harbor is a benchmark and then what the market itself does. The, 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 the worst of the group was the market itself. And in fact, when you look at these, telecom is 157. Shopping was 145. Um, employment was much lower. So even these two, the mean, the mean of these two is, is much higher. Looking at the uh, individual scores, they all seem to hover relatively similarly. But we noticed that sharing, they're much fuzzier when it comes to describing their sharing practices. Um, than any, anything else. Um, we don't have anything on completeness here because as it turned out, on these four metrics, there was only one policy in the group that omitted terms. All, you know, 14 of the 15 policies all addressed uh, these four items. So that's, we've got to think a little bit more about our completeness metric and how we, um, we address completeness. Um, so when we look at this, it really brings us to um, the second question. Uh, it's a much shorter slide because it's sort of a yes or no kind of thing, I guess. Um, is what, what does this tell us about the normative role of regulation? How these different regulatory regimes are affecting, if at all, the clarity of privacy policies? Um, I think what we can say from the results pretty clearly is this regulatory nudge, where the regulators are providing specific language that can be adopted or not by um, the, the industry, that's giving us the greatest clarity. Uh, it's standardized language, standardized after having done a lot of research on what users will understand. Um, the safe harbor, very trivial effect. Um, maybe it helps justify why the uh, European court threw it out two weeks ago. Um, and in effect, it's doing a poor job assuring clarity. If you, want it, if you expect that to provide clear notices, it's not working. What's the rationale for calling it an effect rather than assuming that companies that feel comfortable with the safe harbor policy will voluntarily go into it? Those that don't want that degree of constraint will choose not to participate in the safe harbor policy. I mean, is it having an effect on behavior, or is it simply a sorting of companies? Well, it, it, it's. I guess it's in part. I guess what this is showing is it's not having a, subs, a substantial effect on the behavior for the way in which they draft their policies. It may have a substantive effect on the scope of those policies. So for example, Safe Harbor requires that um, any company subscribing to Safe Harbor provide 
users the ability to opt out of data sharing. So companies may belong to Safe Harbor and provide an opt out that they would not have provided absent Safe Harbor. But in describing that opt out, they're doing a bad job. Safe Harbor is not helping. sets of companies and their practices, as long as being in safe harbor is a voluntary decision, right. doesn't tell you what would happen if companies that otherwise would not choose to be in safe harbor are then required to be, right? Okay. Um, I, I guess maybe I'm not quite un understanding it clearly, but if, if choosing, to be, choosing to be in safe harbor, you're agreeing to be regulated by this regime. One of the attributes that this regime is supposed to accomplish <laughs> is trans clear, effective transparency to the users. So if you're opting in, you're theoretically opting into being more transparent for users, and you have a compliance obligation with Safe Harbor. What our data is showing is that opting in is not, and, that and satisfying that compliance obligation is not resulting in clearer privacy policies than those companies that, that don't care about it. I was, I was responding to the word small positive effect, which seemed to be saying that there was an effect. Right, yeah. If, if you go, we go back to, um, there's a very slight, this is 1.3 and that's 1.4, 1.33 and that's 1.48. But do we, yeah, so my question, and I'll drop it, but yeah. is the, how do we know that that difference is a result of the safe harbor as opposed to self-selection yeah uh, okay yeah uh, good point uh, we don't right that could be that could be a self-select that could be the self-select selected self-selection effect yeah um, so in the end the goal seems to be to have greater I mean there's user notification user not transparency but it's partially about user privacy and my understanding is European data protection laws for consumers are much stronger mm -hmm. so in that I'm trying to think of two examples where we will collect information and users may users can um, opt out, or we may generally collect information and users can opt out. So from a data, one's more vague, but right. from a data protection perspective, they seem identical actually. So that the vagueness, the lack of transparency does not change the ultimate data protections that's Provided but you, you started suggesting, I mean, taking a case where there's a legal right to compel an activity. So if you have no legal right, in Europe you have legal rights. So if the policy is vague, in Europe it doesn't really matter because you still have a statutory right to force an action. Mm -hmm. In the United States, if it's vague and you have no statutory right to force the action, Sorry, I, then, but, then it's going to matter more. That's right. I was giving an example where it... It, it, it really matters where the vagueness lies. Okay. So, you know, we will collect information. You may opt out of any collection. We may, col we may generally collect information. You can opt out of any collection. Right. So the second is, is vaguer, but it doesn't seem to lead to more privacy concern. Because if you opt out, you're opting, you're yeah. opting out, regardless of right. the vagueness of the terms. Mm -hmm. So then you're addressing the substance of the right rather than the clarity of the description. And we're looking, we're looking at the clarity of the description, not the substance of what's being conveyed. And, and you're right, our, our model here uh, is not perfect. We know that there are um, weaknesses and things that we're not capturing. So for example, we didn't, in an earlier iteration of the paper, which we haven't included here, we looked at elasticity of terms. And we started to measure elasticity. And we're probably going to add that back in here, because that's a whole nother uh, metric. So there are lots of different things. We looked at instances for single action information pairs in a sentence. So if there are multiple different, multiple things going on in the same sentence, we're not fully capturing it um, in, in our model. So there's, there's some limitations to what we've been able to construct uh, thus far uh, for it. Um, so the last thing I wanted to address was just some of the public policy considerations, some of the things where this, um, I think, could be useful, some places where it leads. Um, the first is on the technical tool side. Uh, this <coughs> scoring mechanism, the tools that we have developed and are finishing development of, we think will enable um, large-scale scanning and extraction of language uh, for improvement if a drafter wants to improve the language 
And if not, for enforcement, for remedial enforcement, either by regulatory agencies or by <coughs> uh, individuals. So <coughs> the notion here is if we, we can automate all of this, it means you can scan 10,000 privacy policies. And if you have the privacy policies categorized, you can do things like identify, um, is this industry better than that industry? Are policies better on sharing certain kinds of information as opposed to other kinds of information? These sorts of things um, we think we can do. Right now we have the NLP tool that does the scoring. Um, we have some extraction tools, some classifiers and extraction tools that are not co pretty close to being there to be able to extract out the relevant passages associated with different data practices. Um, so the, the pieces uh, we expect within probably the next year uh, to pretty much have it all developed to be able to do this large scale scanning. Um, we can develop some linguistic guidelines. Uh, we know from the Bradley Terry scores what combinations are going to be particularly problematic for users. So it enables us to develop some guidelines that drafters can look at as they're developing these if they are going to strike an appropriate balance between preserving flexibility and effectively conveying to users um, what they're doing. Um, we anticipate seeing some kind of reporting framework so we can have public reporting of vagueness scores. The impact of that is, you know, it's name and shame. Uh, companies that are getting bad scores on their vagueness compared to their industry groups, it gives them an incentive to try to improve the clarity and to, and to push back the tendency to be overly general so as to preserve maximum flexibility on data use. Uh, and then lastly, what I'll, I'll close with is um, we think that there's broader application of this approach and this methodology to other kinds of consumer contracts. So I think of end user license agreements as a classic example. Uh, you read those things, and they suffer from many of the same problems uh, that privacy policies have if you are a user. And these same tools looking at uh, the, the uh, categories and the scoring, we think the same tools can be deployed to measure vagueness in end user agreements. Um, the issue there is we don't know if our terminology was domain specific. So there would have to be some um, grounded analysis to be sure that the taxonomy still works, to be sure that the terms are right. But the approach, the method, the theory, uh, all we think is transferable into this area. And in the context of things like EULAs, EULAs are binding agreements. And if we go back to what I started with, with contract law, if it's ambiguous, it's not a binding agreement. So on the EULA side, this could actually be a m very powerful tool both for the drafters to be sure that their agreements are going to be binding, as well as for users to argue it's not binding. Right? They blew it um, when they drafted. And I will just close. Um, we have a whole bunch of papers and pieces of the technology that's going up on the usableprivacy.org site. So if you're interested in more about the, the broader project, of which this is just a little slice, uh, there's a lot more there. Thank you. Thank you.